can't believe Odin and Freya were ever married. Love and hate are more closely intertwined than you might imagine. For instance, Odin hates the giants and they him. But Thor's own mother was the giantess Björgun, one of Odin's great loves. So Thor's half god and half giant? Weird. Once Fjörgun was gone, lonely ages passed for Odin. And as war with the Vanir raged, I could see what he really wanted beneath his bluster. And after no small amount of convincing, Freya agreed. For a while there, he really turned on the charm. He seemed happy. He seemed interested in making her happy. He granted her so many wishes, I can scarcely recall them all. The peace held, and I truly believed all had worked out better than I could have planned. But Odin's true face showed itself again in the end. Oh, he won Freya's trust, and she taught him some of her Vanir magic, another choice she would live to bitterly regret. Sadly, despite his wise counselor's best efforts to persuade him that peace was the only true path to stave off Ragnarok, Odin never let go of his obsession with Jotunheim. The taste of Vanir magic led him to new forms of experimentation and new levels of depravity. Namir, why did you say Tyr felt responsible for what Odin did to the Giants? There was an incident shortly after the forging of Mjolnir, when Tyr arranged a diplomatic meeting between Odin and the Giant Kings. Well, this was when the Long War was young, when victory was still a thing dreamed of, and the Jotnar might have tipped the balance between Aesir and Vanir. Odin had persuaded Tyr that the hammer was merely a deterrent, a means to broker peace from a position of strength. Tyr was hopeful to convince all parties they would prosper best through peace. He knew the giants were deeply concerned about the hammer, a super weapon in hands they did not trust. But they trusted Tyr. Tyr always believed the best in people, and taking Odin at his word and his desire for peace, he brought the Raven King to Jotunheim. Uh, from there, things unraveled quickly. The giants anticipated Odin's trickery and exposed his true agenda to spy and steal their secret wisdom. With magics, they expelled Odin from their realm and cursed him never to return. Frustrated, Odin visited his fury upon the giants of Midgard. Thor unleashed Mjolnir's might upon any giant he could find. None could stand against the tide of slaughter that followed. And at last, it seems, with Tyr's aid, they retreated. The tower disappeared, no giants could be found in Midgard, and no man nor god has set foot in Jotunheim since. Amir, why did you work for Odin if he's so horrible? It's my career! And if you mean to make your career as a counselor to kings, he can't very well rule out petty maniacs. Available positions are scarce enough. My first master was a cruel piece of work as well, but I learned through him the enduring power of wit which served me well with kings and gods alike. I couldn't have been much older than you when I started. A fairy king's errand boy and unofficial jester. By night, my mates and I had the run of the forest. Good fellows, they called us. Knavish sprites to the last. We'd get up to all manner of mischief, making fools of the local mortals. But as long as our lord was kept amused, we were spared the consequences. Oh. Then one day he was not amused. And I saw fit to move on. Thankfully, the ages and roads traveled since then have turned me from that merry wanderer into the paragon of virtue you see before you today. Amir, how'd you come to be in these lands? Lad, there comes a time in every man's life when he changes his name and heads north to make a new start. If you live long enough to do this many times over, you might end up as far north as this place. By the time I arrived, I already knew Odin by his reputation, and so I set to demonstrate my worth by coming to him with something I knew he'd value. A mystic well of knowledge. Or rather, I should say, a well of water laced with enough mystic mushrooms to make a god see visions. Oh, he was rightly impressed. Can't say for sure what he saw that led him to try gouging out his own eyes, but I managed to restrain him before he finished the job. Then I persuaded him it has been his sacrifice made for an even higher form of sight to be bestowed. Blah, de blah, de blah, de blah. I used to think he never caught on. But the day he took my eye, I realized he had never been fooled. He knew I'd outwitted him. 
called the lesson wisdom and hired me to make sure from then on I was on his side. And for a long, long time I truly was. Doesn't mean he didn't hold a grudge. Mimir, you never told me what happened with the stonemason's son. Rimthur, son of Thamur. After completing his father's masterwork, the Great Wall of Jotunheim, he thought of nothing but making the Aesir pay for their crimes against the giants. Once, he longed to fight Thor, but tragedy had brought wisdom to Hrimthor and cunning. He observed that Asgard's walls were half-built and shoddy, for no Aesir god could be bothered with such tiresome labor. So Hrimthor adopted the guise of an ordinary man and made the Aesir an offer. He would build them majestic new walls, and if he couldn't build them within two turns of the season, they would owe him nothing for his labors. And if he succeeded, he asked only for an audience with the goddess Freya. Odin agreed, knowing the task was impossible, but intrigued by this stranger. Arimthur made short work of it, of course. He had the benefit of his father's training and the aid of a magical stallion for fetching stones. Odin was not happy to find himself on the losing end of the wager, but he seemed to uphold his end of the bargain. Freya was sent to meet the mason, and to her surprise, he wanted only to whisper something in her ear. That being done, he made his way out of Asgard, and when he found Thor awaiting him at the gates of Midgard, he knew he had been double-crossed. But he didn't care, because his plan was complete. It was? What did he say to Freya? Only she could say for certain, but I've had many moons to work it out. Harimthur knew that Freya loathed the Aesir, despite her marriage to Odin, and I believe he gave her the secret to Asgard's defenses. Some weakness he may have built in, structural or magical, which I expect will be exploited come Ragnarok when Surtur arrives to burn Asgard to ash, if not sooner. Thank you, by the way. For what? For saving me. I... I know I screwed things up before Balder grabbed me. <laughs> you did. But you are my son. Okay. What about the giant with eight arms? Starkath the Mighty, he was called. If the giants ever had anything so organized as an army, Starkath would have been their general. An opinion, in retrospect, I should have kept to myself. But no. As Odin's advisor, I kept him advised. And having bent his will towards Starkath's doom, there was no dissuading him. But even Thor wasn't stupid enough to take on Starkath on his own. No. Instead, the Aesir set forth slanders upon Starkath's name, branding him throughout the realms as a monster to be feared. They said he abducted an elf queen who killed herself rather than be ravished by the giant. Lies, of course. You're too young for her story. In the end, even the Vanir gods and the armies of Midgard were roused to the cause. They surrounded Starkath, showered him with arrows until he was brought to his knees. He surrendered, hoping by trial he could clear his name. Thor took advantage and ripped off one of Starkath's arms, which only made it easier to sever another and another until he was satisfied. Relieved of six arms and too much blood, Starkath perished upon the battlefield. Ah, I regret it to this day, you know. I told myself there was nothing I could do, but I wish I'd tried. So, if you remember, I'd started a doozy of a story early. It was about Skadi, Queen of the Hunt. She was called Skadi, Queen of the Hunt. Her father was Thiotsi, who could take the shape of any wild creature and taught Skadi how to hunt them all. From the ribs of pack beasts, she fashioned second feet, allowing her to glide upon the snow so no animal could evade her. She became a huntress beyond compare, even to any god. Odin himself wanted her for his bride, believing she would bear him strong sons. But she spurned his affections, and for that insult... Odin vowed revenge. It was put forth that the Aesir were plagued by an eagle who would steal the precious golden apples of Idun. Not even the finest archer among the gods could bring it down. Odin knew that Skadi could not resist the temptation to prove herself superior, and so she joined the hunt. Skadi tracked the eagle as it flew where she alone could glide, 
and loosed an arrow from her unerring bow. When she collected her quarry, she found no eagle at all. But her own father, poor Theotzi, slain by his own daughter. She was overcome with grief and shame. For there is nothing nature so reviles as a child who kills their parent. Skadi succumbed to her fate as winter's blanket fell, holding her father as the mountain held her in an embrace to last eternity. Well, that was sad. Aye. There aren't many happy endings for the giants, I'm afraid. Lemire, you were in the middle of a story before. Groa the sorceress assembled a library of arcane knowledge, hoping to increase her prophetic powers to find her lost husband. But... It was not her husband she would glimpse in her visions. For it was Groa, seeing longer and farther than any before or since, who witnessed Ragnarok, the end and the beginning. When Odin caught word of her ultimate prophecy, he maneuvered to obtain her knowledge and hoard it for himself. Groa knew Odin as a longtime patron of her services, and so she welcomed him into her library as a friend. What she did not know is that Odin himself was behind her husband's disappearance, having used his enchantments to conceal his death at Thor's hands from her sight. Smiling, jealous Odin took her by the throat, and with his very hands he stole her library and her life for his own. I always knew Odin was bad, but that's just... Ruthless, barbaric, heartless? That's Odin. In fact, we would do well to sit here in silence for the next few moments and reflect on Odin's capacity for cruelty. And so... Reflect longer. Lumiere, can you start that story again from before? If I recall, we had begun to discuss the origin of Ymir, the first giant. In the beginning, there was Ganungagop, the great void. There were no realms yet, only primordial forces. There was fire, and there was ice, and there in the void they met and produced... Water? More than water. The mystic lifeblood of something entirely new. From this water, Ymir took form and became a being of pure creation and chaos, mother and father to all that came after. Even the Aesir? Aye. Every god, man and beast came first from Ymir's flesh. Though it was the Aesir who thought themselves so superior that they should hold dominion over the rest of creation. It was Odin who took arms against his creator and spilled Emir's lifeblood with his spear. A necessary evil, he would say, to bring order to the realms. From Emir's torn flesh, Odin would fashion the realm of Midgard for his own. Called himself All-Father as if he was the creator and not the creator's destroyer. A small, covetous tyrant. Amir? Huh? Oh, sorry, my boy. Uh, you know, I think at best we just end it there, actually. If I'm not mistaken, we've yet to discuss the tale of the giant Bergelmir. Oh, yeah. I remember his shrine. It looked happier than the other ones, mostly. It begins in an ocean of blood. Finally, a story worth hearing. If you remember, Ymir, the first giant, was fatally stabbed by Odin. It's in his blood our story starts. Ymir's magical guts poured out in a torrent so violent it threatened to flood all of creation. The Jotnar were unprepared, as the very last of them were washed away in the endless tide. Not just Ymir but all of giant kind faced extinction. And so would Odin's victory have been complete. But Emir's kind did not all perish that day. Staying afloat in the hollowed husk of a tree, the frost giant Bergelmir endured, as did his lady wife. For weeks they sailed, until finally they came upon a new land. They called it Jotunheim. And there they would start anew. As father and mother, they would multiply exceedingly, and as king and queen, they worked to make Jotunheim a land where giants would know no master but themselves. Bergelmir never sought revenge for Odin's slaughter. His vengeance was to live and prosper. 
He died at peace. A legion of his kin to mourn him. He would ever be known as Bergelmir the Beloved. Bergelmir the Beloved. Huh. I've never heard a story end that way. Not a true one, anyway. If you do, laddie. Lemire, why don't you tell us the story of the giant that stole Thor's hammer? Happily, my boy. It involves your friend Freya, too, though I don't expect it's one she'd enjoy being reminded of. The giant was called Thrym. And he proved cunning enough to make off with Mjolnir while the thunder lummox slept. Sadly for Thrym, he didn't always think with his brain. Though he had robbed the greatest giant killer of his greatest weapon, he offered to trade it back to the Aesir in exchange for Freya as his bride. Now, at this point, Freya was married to Odin, and Odin, frankly, would have traded her for a sufficiently strong mead, but he saw an opportunity here. Thrym's palace was in Jotunheim, and only giants know the way. By agreeing to the marriage, they'd have to escort Freya back to their realm. So, Odin coerced Freya into using her Sather magics to conceal Thor, so he could sneak along with her and infiltrate Jotunheim. When the hammer was produced as the wedding dowry, Thor revealed himself. He took back Mjolnir, and wasted no time in smashing Thrym's skull, followed by every other giant present for the festivities. The only thing that put a stop to it was Freya, who wanted no part of this massacre. She cast a powerful spell that hurtled them both out of Jotunheim with no means of return. Odin was livid, hoping that Thor's foothold in Jotunheim would become his own. And oh, would he ever revenge himself upon Freya? What is the point of this story, Head? Well, for Thrym, the lesson would be to keep his priorities straight. For Freya, it's that doing good has a price. For Thor, it's that no object of power makes you what you are. And if what you are is the biggest butchering bastard in the Nine Realms, nobody can take that away from you. Moving on, then. So how was your trip to Jotunheim? Will you give them a little privacy? The kid just found out he's a giant. He doesn't need you interrogating. Bro, you knew? Oh, we knew Faye was the last guardian of the Jotunar left in Midgard. That's why we made for the axe. We hoped it could restore the balance of power. After Thor went all breezer with our hammer. Though in the end, it seems, she chose another path. She chose, well, you. Both of you. I suppose she figured that was the best chance for the Giants to live on. And now, I suppose, that's up to you. How about that? A young Jotun with us the whole time. And the son of Laufey, the just... Oh, I should have seen it before! Something else we can do for you? Nah, just... Glad you guys worked it out. Ah. Well, I could say the same to you. Huh. I guess I was getting a bit full of myself. Told him what he needed to hear, how's it sounds to me. Just the same. I'm sorry for how I spoke to you, Sindri. Can you forgive me? Already have. Like you said, it all worked out. Now, let us get back to work before I get... ...sentimental. All right, what'd you break? And next time. Better not be fighting with your brother again. Just because he's gotten a little less annoying over the years doesn't mean I ain't got a customer base of my own to keep happy. Oh, yeah? Who's that? Well, you came back here, didn't you? Fair point. Come here. What did you call Mother? Halfway the Just? Did you know her? I never had the pleasure. Lothi was a rumor in the halls of Asgard. A giantess warrior who thwarted many an Aesir god's plans. Freeing those who they would enslave, feeding those who they would starve, generally making a nuisance of herself in the most noble of ways. Thor was terribly frustrated he could never find her to fight. Since my imprisonment began, I could only wonder what became of her, and who she would turn out to be. Yours is quite a singular lineage, lad. 